This is on assignment. Welcome to On Assignment. I'm Imran Siddiqui here with Alex Villarreal. A seaside town in Somalia is now free of Islamist militants. We'll talk with our reporter who was there. Burma's leading voice for democracy visits VOA. We'll take you behind the scenes of our exclusive interview. Journalists are dangerously under fire now around the world, but there are some safety guidelines they should know. And in Italy, some struggling businesses are looking to a global power for financial help. It's these stories and more as we take you on assignment. Since African Union forces took control of the Somali port town of Marka three weeks ago, people there say that life is beginning to return to normal. Citizens of the village south of Mogadishu say they are enjoying more freedom than before. But security remains a challenge. Our correspondent in Nairobi, Gabe Joslow, just came back from Marka. Here's what he told us. Marka is sort of a fishing village with a, a fairly sizable port about 100 kilometers south of Mogadishu. Um, it's a place uh, that it's very picturesque. Back in the day, it was like a tourist destination for well-to-do Somalis. Uh, and it was in, under al-Shabaab's control uh, since about 2008 until three weeks ago uh, when African Union peacekeeping forces known as AMISOM uh, came in and, and drove the militants out of there, actually without much of a fight. Al-Shabaab has used Marka as a base to launch attacks in the region. Amasam recently seized a large cache of weapons from a house belonging to a militant commander. Amasam commander Lieutenant Colonel Silver Muwezi says Al-Shabaab has been weakened as a military force, but he says his soldiers have a harder time fighting the small-scale hit-and-run attacks that still take place. The problem with these guys, I think they have mustard bombs. Bombs, it's the most dangerous weapon. Amasam says there have been at least four grenade attacks targeting soldiers since the militants left Marka. The town was strategically important for al-Shabaab. Its port served as a major supply route for weapons. Amasam officials say senior militant commanders, including foreign fighters, would meet in town to discuss operations, and they had a recruitment center nearby. And now that they're believed to have been driven out of the area, they're thought to have gone south uh, to the city of Kismayo, which is really the next big target, uh, for Amazon and the regional militaries uh, who are, are trying to get rid of the militants. Now, in your report, it, it says that even though they've fled, but a lot of the elements of al-Shabaab remain in the town and they're, they're conducting these attacks. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's the thing is that, you know, it, it's not that al-Shabaab is fighting this kind of frontline battle anymore. I mean, in Mogadishu, for instance, uh, Amazon was fighting these prolonged street battles with, you know, hundreds of al-Shabaab fighters uh, taking strong positions in the city. Uh, now what happens is Amazon enters a smaller city and al-Shabaab has already left for the most part. But you still have these elements, these remnants who uh, might lay an improvised explosive device, you know, a homemade bomb in the street, or might throw a grenade at security forces. In fact, there have been at least four attacks on security forces in Marka since Amazon has taken control. So that's, that's really how they've switched strategies. Now Al-Shabaab uh, are doing these hit-and-run guerrilla-style tactics. So uh, even though their, their forces have left for the most part, they still really pose uh, a serious uh, security threat in these areas. Tell us a little bit about the reaction of the people, the citizens. Are they scared? Do they think that they might go out to make a living and might not be able to come back home because there might be this attack by the remaining elements of Al-Shabaab? I think it's, uh, there's mixed feelings on the ground. I mean, there were some people in Marka who really welcomed Amasam as soon as they came in because now Shabab used that city, uh, had this oppressive form of law in that city, which were including, you know, really severe punishments for things like smoking, drinking, uh, uh, anything that they seemed uh, deemed to be a violation of their strict interpretation of Islamic law. Fahia sells cigarettes outside a mosque. Under al-Shabaab, she says she would have been severely punished for selling tobacco. You would be caned or imprisoned. You would be taken to an open field where they would call people and start caning you 20 to 30 times, counting every lash out loud. What kind of life do they have over there? Do they have internet access, clean water, satellite TV? I mean, how do they see us? Do they know that there's a concern out there with regards to what's happening in that part of the region? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, certainly they do have satellite TV. They have excellent mobile phone uh, networks. I mean, they're not far from Mogadishu, which, which does have all of those amenities. Uh, the city itself is, uh, you know, people were moving in and out of that city quite a bit uh, in the time that Al-Shabaab was there. People who had homes uh, were driven out, so they, were, they went off into Mogadishu. Some of them joined the diaspora in other parts of the world. Uh, and so, you know, especially those elements, these really international, these traveler uh, types, uh, were well aware of the situation in Marco. We're communicating with their families back in the United States, uh, back in the United Kingdom. And that's something you see all across uh, Somalia, is a lot of concern from the diaspora community and a lot of support for the people that are still there. So uh, for the most part, I think those international connections are what keep, uh, you know, Somalis in Marka and other small towns across Somalia uh, attuned to what's going on in the rest of the world and vice versa. Thanks to Gabe Joslo, our Nairobi correspondent, for his story. We're taking a break now. When we return, why did a U.S. development agency suddenly find itself out in the cold? You're watching On Assignment. Russian officials say they're ordering the U.S. Agency for International Development to close its operations in the country because its pro-democracy programs have interfered in Russian elections. But U.S. officials say the assistance is meant only to increase democratic participation. VOA's Brian Patton has been following the story. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. This decision by Mr. Putin, do you think it was sudden or was it normal? It's been brewing for some time. In fact, one analyst I talked to said several years ago in Ukraine during the Orange Revolution uh, when, when the opposition movement united and, and, and took over control from a Russia-backed government that Putin himself was quite angry about this and blamed the U.S. intervention for that. Wow. Well, let's uh, take a look at the story and we'll come back after this. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the leaders of Russia asked the U.S. for assistance in building a democracy and a market economy. Over the past 20 years, election monitoring groups, human rights organizations, and anti-corruption efforts have been funded in part by USAID, which has provided more than $2.6 billion to Russia. President Vladimir Putin has now ended USAID's programs, reportedly out of concern they interfere with elections by aiding opposition groups. But David Satter, a foreign policy analyst with the Hudson Institute, says USAID programs do not pick political sides. Instead, he says, the programs try to help disenfranchise groups use legal, peaceful, and democratic means to get their voices heard. The existence of such groups gives to people, on the one hand, the know-how to defend their rights, and on the other, the conviction that defending their rights is possible. Earlier this year, Egypt's military leaders overseeing the transition to an elected government attempted to prosecute U.S.-funded pro-democracy and human rights groups. They relented after weeks of heavy diplomatic pressure from the United States. James Goldgeier, the dean of American University School of International Service, says the most vocal critics of U.S. democracy programs are often elite leaders trying to hold on to power in the face of growing popular opposition. If you are an authoritarian leader and you have a group that is fostering civil society, you are going to naturally fear that that funding is helping people who would like you to not be in the, not be the ruler anymore. Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez has also been critical of U.S. pro-democracy efforts, saying they have attempted to undermine his socialist agenda. Goldgeier says the U.S. does indeed promote a different ideology. Well, the United States in general tends to support democracy, a market economy, rule of law, and protection of human rights. So if those things are at odds with what a particular government might be promoting, then there will be a conflict. Goldgeier says the U.S. does not pick political sides, but it does support building a framework of democracy that preserves majority rule and minority rights. Brian Patton, VOA News, Washington. So, Brian, what happens when a country refuses U.S. aid funding, uh, which is for pro-democracy? Well, in the case of Russia, 
it's going to lose not only its pro-democracy funding, which has gone mostly to human rights organizations, election monitor organizations, not to opposition groups, but it's also going to lose money for AIDS research, uh, lose money for other medical vaccination efforts, for education efforts. These, this, is all, this was all part of the package that Russia was receiving, and it's going to lose all of that together. Now, some have said it's legitimate to talk about uh, the U.S. pulling back some of this aid anyway. Uh, the U.S. has been there for 20 years now, invited in 20 years, $2.6 billion of aid over this time. Russia is, is not a poor country. Russia is now has in some, it may not have a perfect democracy, but it does have uh, uh, a vibrant opposition, uh, groups of oppositions, uh, parties operating. They are you know, uh, being drowned out right now by the government forces, but there are different actors now legitimately in place in Russia. It's not a dictatorship. It is not a complete dictatorship. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, there you can, we can talk about, you know, whether there's undue influence in elections, whether re elections are rigged, whether he is, in fact, for all purposes, uh, Vladimir Putin, a dictator but he has been elected, uh, they have been flawed elections, but opposition parties are still rallying, opposition parties are still raising money and, and are allowed to organize. Thank you, Brian. VOA's Brian Patton. We're taking another break. Coming up, our VOA Burmese reporter talks about his interview with Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi. You're watching On Assignment. Burmese democracy advocate Aung San Suu Kyi has made a two-week visit to the United States. Her trip included a stop at VOA headquarters here in Washington for an exclusive interview with VOA Burmese reporter Jia Zanda. Two years ago, Aung San Suu Kyi was released from house arrest in Burma after spending more than 15 years in detention. And this year, she and members of her party won some seats in parliament. But is that a sign that reform is truly underway in Burma? I asked that question. So you posed this question to Aung San Suu Kyi about this view that people have that the reforms aren't actually taking place and instead they're just empty rhetoric. What did she say to that? She said that is a mistake to say there is no reforms at all. She said there is some sort of reforms taking place in Burma, but what he, she emphasized was uh, they have to do a lot more poverty is uh, everywhere, even water, availability of water is a great problem in the country, education, health, everything needs to do more. So you, you mentioned these problems that still persist, but have these changes, are they affecting people on a daily basis and are people feeling these effects? The first thing is people are more, they feel freer than before. They are like to talk to the journalists. If you talk to anybody in Rangoon or Burma, they are willing to talk to the journalists. Before, they are always shut up. No, they don't want to say anything. They want to close your microphone. Or they, everybody will run away. Now they want to talk to you. And the media is a little bit freer than before. The facts and uh, opinion. Opinions are not that much free at the moment. You cannot criticize the government outright in the media, but you can mention the facts, the reality. What happened. And what happens to you? What th possible threats do you face if you do criticize the government? National security is the most priority. You can do whatever you like freely, freedom of expression, unless you infringe the, the national security. So how can you define the national security? Whose security actually it is? So journalists and activists are now asking the government to revoke that national security emergency law. Turning back to your interview with Aung San Suu Kyi, if you could pinpoint one question that you felt was the most important that you were able to ask her, what would that be and why? Uh, I asked her, uh, the Burmese parliament uh, or legislature, I think legislature is very important, freedom of legislature. Legislature is the only organ of state which represents directly the people. So is, the rubber, is that still a rubber stamp parliament as people accused before, you know? 
Is there any freedom of the legislature? Can you talk freely? I asked her that question. Why she defend that, you know, because she herself is now a member of the parliament. How can it be a rubber stamp? We are there, so we never do that sort of thing. And for you, this opportunity to sit down with Aung San Suu Kyi, who is such an international icon, what was that like for you as a journalist? Oh, it is, it is a great uh, thing for me to do because I have interviewed her before on radio by telephone. Was there anything that struck you about her, seeing her in person? She is so fragile, you know, she is so thin, so I wish her to be healthy and yeah, we can see her healthy in good shape, so I'm very happy to see her, so to talk to her. And when she was under house arrest, uh, how was she getting her information? I've heard reports that she actually listened to Voice of America. Yeah, yeah. We are very proud to feed her the, all the information, the necessary information. So what was the significance then of her visiting VOA? That is one of that uh, response from her, I think. <laughs> she also mentioned that she thanks us and VOA and foreign-based uh, broadcasting stations, information, you know, knowledge about the world during her long period of house arrest. That's why I think she came here. So in terms of the reform process, what can we expect to see in the coming months? In the coming months is too soon, I think. We have to take longer than months. My personal view, there is not a concrete opposition in Burmese parliament. That's all Burmese service, yeah. Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy, NRD colleagues, are just 43 out of 400 seats. So they are known as opposition, but they have no weight at all. But her popularity is so great. <laughs>Evolving technologies and changing economies of scale allow a journalist to produce an online magazine or quality multimedia reports for a fraction of what it would have cost in the past. So organizations do not want to pay a lot for the news they are getting, leaving a great many journalists reporting dangerous stories, from oil spills to local highway accidents, armed conflict to political demonstrations, tsunamis to organized crime, on their own, with little or no support or training. There are organizations that are trying to help with this situation and trying to give journalists and even citizen journalists the skills and the tools that they need yes. to be able to keep themselves safe. And one of those is the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is what you focused on in your report. What are some yes. of the recommendations that they have? The Committee to Protect Journalists, their main focus is that security has become a core function of being a journalist. So they are focusing on uh, having, uh, enabling journalists to do reporting in a way that, that they can feel prepared and safe. CPJ Senior Advisor for Journalist Security, security Frank Smythe, says the committee's updated Journalist Security Guide reflects these changes. Notably, journalists have to take responsibility for their own security, that it can no longer be outsourced to others. Security is a core function of being a journalist. There are three, three basic components of, of journalist security, and that are physical safety, digital safety, and finally emotional self-care. The sense in which the guide is written 
is that uh, journalists have to take responsibility for their own security. These journalists that we've seen being killed recently, especially in areas like Syria, mm -hmm. are they casualties of the conflict around them? They're embedded in these areas, or is it that they're actually being targeted? Most of the journalists that are killed worldwide, and the CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, quotes um, they, they, in, their, in their data, they have seen that three out of four journalists killed worldwide are, um, actu are outright murdered. Definitely a wide range of difficulties and dangers facing yes. journalists worldwide, so we of course wish all of our colleagues abroad um, to stay safe. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. And now we head to Italy, where Europe's economic crisis has left businesses in the industrialized north with fewer customers and a lack of credit. And some are turning to China to stay alive. Reporter Rebecca Valley talks with one Italian businessman who made the difficult decision to sell his 50-year-old company to a Chinese firm. Let's take a look at that story. When Renato Bianchi founded Cibi Ferrari in the late 1960s, the Italian economy was booming. Over the next four decades, his company grew from a handful to about 160 employees. But when the global economic crisis hit in the mid-2000s, orders began to decrease, and Bianchi says he started losing more than a million dollars of business a year. I thought we had to change businesses because we could not make it. Either we started doing something else or we sell the company. Our competitors, Swiss, German, and Italian companies, were all very interested in buying. We started having talks with all of them, and the amount of money they were willing to spend was considerable. But instead, Bianchi chose to sell to a Chinese company. For less money, he says, but with one important guarantee. The best thing about the deal was that they would leave the company as it were. The Chinese company was okay with keeping the managers and the workers, and that for me was very important. It meant that I was not betraying my workers, my people. Chibi Ferrari produces automatic precision machines that make turbines for the auto, aeronautical and energy industries. The Chinese state-owned company that purchased Bianchi's company makes similar but much less sophisticated machines. Economist Roberta Rabellotti says that the Chinese companies are looking for an upgrade in Europe. Just like Marco Polo went to China and brought back technological innovation, in this case it's the Chinese who are coming to Europe, to Italy, and need to acquire intangible assets like knowledge, managerial skills. But in this case it's the other way around, which we call the reverse Marco Polo effect. Although it is advanced in its industries, Italy has a highly bureaucratic business environment which often works against foreign investment. It ranked lower than many developing countries in a World Bank survey that assessed the ease of doing business globally. Rabelotti said that this is why Italy has traditionally attracted less investment from China than other European neighbors. But the economic crisis is changing that. In Italy, there are a lot of companies in crisis. Capital is needed, and China has that capital. Many entrepreneurs here are in extreme difficulties and do not see an alternative solution to selling. Rabellotti says fears of what she calls robbery investment remains high in Italy. There is negative rhetoric around Chinese, and that is precisely because there are many examples of purchases that end up with transfer of technology and closed operation, so the fear is legitimate. Rabellotti says that the best way to fight that fear is to show that there are positive examples where Chinese investment helped develop the local economy. Bianchi believes his company is one such example. Rebecca Valli, VOA, Milan. All right, so that's our show for this week. Join us again next week when we look at nuclear power plants in Japan. And we'll also talk with our reporter about the religious life of Mormons, such as U.S. presidential hopeful Mitt Romney. For more on today's program, check out voanews.com, where you can see all of our episodes. And we're also on Facebook and YouTube as well. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next week. See you next time.